What do you think about when I say 13th century? It's probably not global arms deals, deterrence, escalations and grand strategic maneuvers. But you'd be wrong. The medieval world had all that as long as you replace fighter jets and missiles with war horses. I'm Anirudh Kanesati, historian and author of Lords of the Deccan. Welcome to Thinking Medieval, where every week we tell you something new about our complex, innovative past. Always feel free to check out our research and citations in the description below and join us in figuring out how to think about our messy, bloody, dazzling history. Through the early 1200s, the Mongol people had created an empire unlike anything the world had ever seen. It stretched across Eurasia, from Russia to Iran to China, and it reshaped networks of trade and exchange. All of these regions began to interact at bigger and bigger scales, and Iran and China became especially interconnected over sea. In the medieval world, if you wanted to move between East and West Asia, your ships would need to catch the monsoon winds across the Indian Ocean, stopping for seasonal trade in South Asia. We sometimes think that what happened in the rest of the world didn't really affect India, but that's a little silly. Just like today, the medieval subcontinent responded to and drove transformations in the world system. The South Indian Peninsula at the time was dominated by four imperial polities. The Sayoni Yadavas in the Northern Deccan, the Hoysalas in the Southern Deccan, the Kakatiyas in the Eastern Deccan, and the Pandyas along the Gulf of Mannar. These were all wealthy and militaristic powers and were well connected to trade networks across the Indian Ocean. They immediately understood the changing contours of exchange in this new Mongol ruled world. Mongol dynasties encouraged the breeding of horses for their armies as well as for export. We know of Indian merchants such as the Kudurai Chetti caste in southern India and the Hedapuka caste in western India who made fortunes as horse traders at this time. Historical records from Yemen where Arab breeders and traders auctioned thousands of horses every year mention lots of Indian buyers. They paid in gold and silk for hundreds of fine steeds to feed into the battlefields of the subcontinent. But that didn't always mean guaranteed profits. During his travels in the 1270s, the Venetian trader Marco Polo noticed that the Sayone Adavas were so desperate for war horses that they connived with pirates to seize these merchant shipments. On the other hand, the Kakatiya dynasty attempted to woo horse traders with preferential trading measures. In the Motupalli inscription of 1244, the king Ganapati Deva declared that whereas previous kings had seized all goods lost in shipwrecks, he would generously return such goods to merchants, asking only that they pay customs fees. This worked amazingly. Historian Ranibir Chakravarti has shown that horses were brought to Kakatiya territories from as far away as Iran, Bhutan, Yunnan, and the Tibetan Plateau. Even more ambitious than the Kakatiyas and Sayone Yadavas were the Pandya dynasty. According to historian Elizabeth Lambern in the 1290s, an important Mongol family served as the Pandya's advisors and chief procurers both in Tamil and Iranian ports. They had such a large budget in their hands that they acquired thousands of horses for the Pandya cavalry. That was such a big share of the global market that the Pandyas ended up impacting horse prices in markets from Hormuz to Kailpatnam. As much as 220 dinars of red gold was spent on a single animal. They wanted to make sure that merchants were insulated from the risks of sea transport, so the full price was paid whether horses were alive or dead by the time they reached the shores of India. That means that the Pandyas were attempting to secure a monopoly on war horses and deprive their rivals of this crucial military resource. Ultimately though, it wasn't bags of money but effective tactics and grand strategy that allowed an Indian power to monopolize the horse trade. South India was safe enough from the Mongol conquests and it could trade with them, but North India wasn't. The Delhi Sultanate was attacked by expanding Mongol polities in the late 1290s which meant that it could not import horses from Central Asia anymore. And so it decided that the most cost-effective way of getting horses again was by attacking, in turn, the kingdoms of the peninsula. According to military historians Simon Digby and Jean Deloche, the Pandyas, Kakatiyas and other powers were very much on par with the Sultanate technologically. But what the Sultanate did have were cavalry archers who could move and retreat with great speed. And so, through multiple campaigns in the early 1300s, the Delhi general Malik Kafur paired this advantage with subterfuge and local intelligence. 
he always struck when the kingdoms were least expecting him, usually directly besieging their capitals and avoiding field engagements that he might lose. He demanded thousands of horses in tribute from the Yadavas, Kakatiyas, and Pandyas while also plundering wealthy temples. All of these were pretty standard tactics in medieval warfare, and honestly, if it had been Genghis Khan or Shivaji, not Malik Kafur doing it, we'd have admired it as textbook examples of how a smaller, mobile army can defeat larger and slower ones. An accidental side effect of losing all their war horses meant that the kingdoms of southern India lost much of their wealth, as well as the weapons that they needed to maintain control within their territory and to fight off enemies. Without horses, these kingdoms collapsed rapidly, and Delhi, using those same horses, defeated the Mongols and then expanded into the power vacuum in South India. That didn't last for too long though, and new Deccan empires were able to break the monopoly. So, what lessons can we take away from these 13th and 14th century dynamics? Medieval South Indians spent a huge portion of their budget to ensure military resources that could only come from very far away. But medieval North Indians, even though they were originally on the back foot, figured out that sometimes your enemy's strength is also their fatal weakness. It's actually pretty crazy if you think about it, that one tiny city in the northwest of India could have been so smart and lucky that it defeated so many major powers, becoming enormously wealthy and successful. So successful that it's still India's capital today. The medieval world is in some obscure and irrelevant place, but one just like ours, just a little earlier. We hope that learning about it taught you something about the world we live in. If you have questions or comments, we'd love to hear them. For more videos that'll make you think, follow us on all of our social media handles. You can find me on Instagram at anirbuddha and at connectedhistories and on Twitter at akanisetti. We'll see you next week.